Some pyramids of Giza in Cairo could only have been built by a people with absolute mastery of engineering, architecture, physics, mathematics, astrology, and a host of other sciences. Down through time after their construction, scholars and scientists from around the world have come here to study not only the physical structures, but who built them, how they did it, and why. Professor Yosef ben Yakinen is an Egyptologist, having taught at Cornell University for over 15 years. Dr. Ben, as he is affectionately known, has lectured widely on both sides of the Atlantic. His theme, the ancient civilizations of Egypt. His presentations have placed him in great demand by students and community groups, especially those of African descent. Perhaps the high regard he enjoys today stems from his long, unwavering theme that the ancient civilizations along the Nile were African. In his many appearances on Like It Is, he has said so emphatically, time after time, in the face of most of the curriculums and the Cecil B. DeMille's of our day. This is why Like It Is came to Egypt with Dr. Ben, to have him show us what he's been saying to us for such a long time. From the Nile's east bank to the west bank. Our journey's first stop was at the wondrous pyramids of Giza. How big is this pyramid that we're on? Which, which this, pyramid are so we this, on now? This is what we are in the one of Khufu, which the Greeks called Cheops. This is 48 stories tall. About a story, let's say, it's one, from one floor to the next floor, 10 feet. So you got 48 times 10, 480 foot tall. Now, the metal you see on the top there, showing you where the, the end of the capstone was originally, before it was removed. So it will be fought. But then the building goes down into the ground. What you see there is the earth surface, earth level. But below there, you got now two stories down, where you got cutways, walkways, tunnels, and so forth. And recent uh, sounding, they have voids that they believe to be other rooms or whatever, chambers or so forth. Now, downstairs you have beautiful work, the, the friezes and the, uh, so forth that tells various things that the average person will see on the outside. But it's about three and a half city blocks, three times 200 plus a fraction, 640 feet. Each leg is three and a half city blocks. Roughly square, a square of 640 feet. You got about two million uh, blocks in this building. About two million. How much do, do they estimate each one of these blocks of granite? This is granite. Uh, no, no. This, this is, is limestone. limestone. How did they bring that stone all the way from and barges and floating barges? Uh, re quite recently, they found the air where they dock, uh, like a wharf, uh, harbor where they were able to come off the Nile and come up into this area and bring the, the, the stones that were brought. Now, you're a civil engineer. How was this thing built? How did they, once they got the blocks here, how did they put them on top of one another? How, how, what is the nature of this awesome building? There are a lot of theories. 
mine, if I could add mine, and it may not be mine, some other people may have thought of it, but I take my theory from Karnak Temple, or the Temple of Warit. There is an excess of a ramp left there. And there's some places, you can see some pieces of ramp. So it is obvious that they use the ramp system. The higher they go to keep the same pitch, the longer the ramp came, so they can keep the same degree. It was easy then, because remember, you have about three, four hundred thousand people not working during the inundation period, the flood period. All of these monuments, wherever you go, are built in highland, above the flood level. So when the flood come, these workers, these farmers have nothing to do. They have this. So they can, not the, the, this myth about slave labor? Nonsense. Slave labor is nonsense. Pure, mitigated nonsense. These men were not guessing. They knew definitely what they were about to do. Is it true that each corner of this pyramid represents dead north, south, east, right. and west? It is. It is. It's an untarget, as I said. The most modern engineering, geological, uh, geosophical instruments cannot do this. Dr. Ben, was it always called a pyramid? And no, why? pyramid is a Greek word. Uh-huh. Uh, Meaning what? House of fire. House of fire. Yeah, pyra, 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 mid is house. Pyromania. Pyromania, house uh, of fire. Why did they call it that? Well, it, I could understand a firehouse. It's just like saying Heliopolis, uh, instead of saying on. Uh, the, the, uh, the on would be with the sun, or the house, uh, the city of the sun. Well, since the sun was symbolically, Ra, was symbolically the expression of the deity, of the god, then here, the pharaoh was building a place where he could come in tune with Ra. That's why the solar boat, so he can go on to the sea of Ra, the next world. So what is a pyramid actually? What is the function of the pyramid when it was built? It's the resting place, the final resting place for the body, the cat of the pharaoh. And people, all kinds of people have different theories, but the only one we can get from the ancients would read in the works, it was the final resting place. And when you came here, like everyone who looks upon this, it blows your mind. Then I decided I got to study it. Because I didn't come with intent to study. I came with intent to see, just to see. Well, who did you go to when you were here? You were just here on your own? I was here on my own. Believe it, I had just married. I, I, you know, I, I, the tradition. My father and mother pick out my wife. I had to marry by the culture. It was, I'm going to marry the girl, I marry her. She's pregnant, and my father said, look, you got to go, you don't have much time. We are going to take all the expenses for your wife, and we want you to come back before she deliver, so you must go, because it's not going to be much more time. I want you to go before I die. He wasn't going to die. He was a young man. Uh, I mean, the possibility of dying was remote at that time. But he felt that he wanted me to see this because I had been always complaining of people saying that I came from a place where people eat people, that in Africa this, you know, in Africa that, that the, the whole Nile Valley that I was boasting I was nothing. And so my father said, no, when you come back, you tell me who doesn't have civilization. Is it you or the European? Now, there are three here that are right alongside one another. Father, what? son, and, and, and grandson. I see. The father is one Khufu, the son, the one behind this, Hapra, and the grandson, the last one, Menkara. Well, now, that high point that you were standing at, as you looked at it, which is which? <laughs> There's a little trick here. You can't build a pyramid older, bigger than your father's, or higher. <laughs> so what Kafra did is build a pyramid smaller than his father's, but on higher ground. So... It looks big. <laughs> it looks bigger than his father's pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't violate his father's instruction. But he did his damage. But he anyway. did his damage. <laughs> In Cairo, from where? Alexandria. Alexandria. When you went there by boat? I went to Alexandria by boat, and I came down to Cairo by uh, freight train. Now, where did you tell me where you went from there? 
Well, I went and got housing uh, at the El Neil Hotel. Then from the El Neil, I got a freight train going south, which is in this direction, until I got down here at Luxor. Uh, and at, at this point, the railway station is uh, back away from the Nile a bit, the city of Luxor per se, uh, not here at the waterfront. All right, now before we head on that journey south, you of course went to the pyramids at Giza. In, 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 yeah, I went in Cairo. Cairo. When they, at that area, there was only one building and that was the uh, Mena House. And they are considered to be way out in the country. Way out. They were, the Cement Village and all those places were not there uh, yet. You went to, to the pyramids at Giza and you were pretty much on your own, but you tried to join a group of students who were there with a professor from England, is that true? Yes. Would a, you repeat that again? There was a professor by the name of Goodenough, and he had, I think it was six or seven uh, students. In those days, there was no school for Egyptology. Uh, you either was in a school for architecture, religion, <coughs> uh, archaeology or so, any of those disciplines, and you came and study with a field man, and you learn in the field. Uh, there were very few so-called textbooks in Egyptology. Uh, e Egyptology was a thing which you did your apprenticeship with a person in the field. What happened when you ran into this professor? Well, when I went to saw the professor and saw what they were doing, it was right down the alley of what I wanted to do. What were they doing? They were do digging, they were uh, examining and uh, looking at the reliefs in the various buildings. I asked to join in with them. And I was honestly told that they were sorry that they didn't uh, take people of my color and uh, the exact uh, words. And I said, well, I, it would be nothing wrong I was doing. I was willing to compromise and I wouldn't get into their way. And. Uh, he finally said, well, all right, you could stay and go around what we do, but you can't sleep along with us. You would have to sleep away from us. Tell me some of the names that you were referred to as. I was uh, called Snow White. Uh, by this professor? By professor and the other students. At the time when they want to relate to me, they said Snow White or uh, Black Boy. Uh, uh, there were so many other names. Black Sambo, and, and they would come out and out and say it whenever they felt like it. Sometimes they would say African, and that's supposed to be an, uh, an insulting word to call me an African. I was supposed to feel bad, but that one I was very happy. When they called me African, I was happy that day. Did you get into the Museum of Cairo at that time? No, because the Museum of Cairo, they wouldn't let me go in there. You didn't get, you didn't, no, you, you didn't go in the Museum of Cairo looking like me. You actually couldn't go in there looking like me. Libraries? Did you go to a university? They were yet? not open to me. So you were really on your own? Yes. Uh, Egypt under the British at that time was no different than Georgia or Mississippi in the United States to a black person. The pyramids in Giza, did you just examine one or did you examine all three and the Sphinx? I really at the time didn't examine per se. Uh, I knew that the tunnel, the, the downstairs or into the pyramid, that they were downstairs, walkways and so forth. They weren't open to me at that particular time. Going through the streets of Cairo today, heavily congested, we see all the shops and a lot of people. Was it pretty much like that in those days? No. Uh, Cairo got 16, 15, 14, 15, whatever million people. I think in those days Cairo may have had close to a million if that much. It had a, a quite a, it was a quite a healthy sized city but uh, in 1939 I, I couldn't tell you the monk because I didn't have that leisure to look that close to the part the population but I guess it was pretty close to 500,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right so you boarded this train and you headed south and your first stop was Luxor, and then you went down to Aswan. Yes, the first stop was Luxor, 
And it took two, two and a half days to get down to Luxor. And then from there? And from there, uh, I went, uh, I heard there were quite a lot of things to see in the West Bank. I saw uh, the East Bank, uh, and then I could imagine uh, what was on the uh, uh, West Bank. But I didn't have time to go to the West Bank because I wanted to go down as far as I could where the tray went, and that was Aswan. Nile flows downward to the north. Here, the pace is tranquil and most beautiful. The people here are, as Dr. Ben himself would say, burnt of skin. On the afternoon of our arrival on a sailboat called a Feluca, Dr. Ben unfolded the story of the ancient civilizations of the Nile. According to a great high priest of ancient Egypt by the name of Unefa, H-U-N-E-F-E-R. He wrote a papyrus. It's known as the papyrus of Hunefa, the paper of Hunefa. He said, we came from the beginning of the Nile where God happy dwells at the foothill of the mountain of the moon. <coughs> the mountain of the moon, there are two places in Egypt, I mean in Africa named mountain of the moon. One is between Ethiopia and o Kenya and Tanganyika, called Kilimanjaro, means mountain of the moon. The other is in Uganda, Renzori. It also means mountain of the moon. So when you look at it, there's two bodies of water that make up the Nile here. The Nile came down as a body of water from Ethiopia called the Blue Nile. The White Nile is a body of water from Uganda. Both of these bodies of waters meet in Khartoum in Sudan. They continue from further north from the south, and they meet another body of water out of the Ethiopian highland, and that's called the Atbara River. And in Atbara, Sudan, those other two bodies meet. Therefore, from then on, to here and to the Mediterranean, which was called the Great Sea. That body of water, the Nile, has been the one that played the highway for a major civilization that started in Central East Africa and reached its zenith in this land. And so you're saying then that the people of Central Africa m migrated north up along this river? Yes, I'm saying that the original high culture where the people first start to make scratches, symbols, writing down, erratic and so forth, finally develop into al alphabetical presentations, mathematical signs, uh, religious signs and, sex and symbols and so forth. They actually had their beginning in Central East Africa. All right, so there were several thousand years that encompassed this dynastic period that preceded the birth of Christ. If you deal with Manetho's figure, it would be from 4100 B.C. 4,000 years. Yes, and to 30. Now, uh, this... if you deal with other figures like Mariette, uh, Budge, uh, um, Maspero, and others, they got varying period or varying dates for the beginning of the dynastic period. All right, now this is a long period of time. Um, there were several kings or pharaohs and queens. A lot happened in this period. There were wars. If someone wanted to get an overview of what was the most significant periods in this 4,000 odd year period, what would you point to? What kings were the most significant or pharaohs? What queens were the most important? In reality, that's very hard to do. Hmm. However, since we all have opinions, the 18th dynasty would consider to be the one with the most action. However, I would have to say the first dynasty in that, that brought into effect all that happened after that. Uh, man, what happened is this southern man, the country was divided into two, the north and the south. This man in the south 
Nama, a king, organized his other vassals, other small kings, against the men in the north to have a unity, a man called Scorpion. They met in a battle, a battle for unity. Either the south was going to control the north or the north was going to control the south. And they met at a place called Memnepha to the called Memphis. The war was fought there and the men from the south, Nama, won. He took his concept of the deity, God, Ra, against the man who lost his concept of the deity, Amen. You would think that he would put Ra in front since he's the one that won, but no. He was wise. Psychologically, he said, no, I wouldn't change. He let the God of the North be the first to be mentioned, and thus he made one God out of two, Amen, Ra. So the people in the North said, this must be a good man. He let our God be the first to be mentioned. And all of this was devised in a place called Memphis. Memnepha or Memphis. Now, if we were to go to Memphis, what would we see today? Are there anything that's remnant of that period? Very little. You will see some statues by Ramesses II, uh, one at least uh, about 40 feet, 30, 40 feet. Uh, two in the yard, general yard, one of them having come to Tennessee when the Ramesses exhibit had come there, another one almost as large, and some other smaller uh, statues. But the main buildings uh, of the Temple of God, Ptah. Ptah was in the mythology the God who made gods, responsible for making gods. The God of all gods. The God of all gods. And you would see his, uh, what's left of his temple, just sporadic pieces of foundation here and there. There isn't at least a quarter floor, or the height of a quarter floor, any place. Was this done in Ramesses' lifetime? The, the statue, yes. It was. Yes. Does he order, did he order things like you this? Know, you know, it was in his lifetime, why? Why? Because he is standing on the life foot. Left yes. foot forward. If he was standing this way, it would be, you know, he's dead. He's dead when he's dead together. But he's standing this way, he's alive. Very near to Memphis is a place called Saqqara, where the world's first pyramid was built, although it was shaped somewhat differently. Dr. Ben showed us. Did the pharaoh design this pyramid and order its building, or did somebody else? No. As a matter of fact, he had no business at all with it. The idea came from his prime minister who was also an architect. As a matter of fact, he was a multi-genius, the first one recorded in all of human history. You've got to consider we're talking about, about 2800 BC. Uh, this man called I-M-O-Tep, or for short, Imhotep. He didn't want his pharaoh to be buried like other pharaohs. He thought his pharaohs should be buried in a much more glorious state than the wood uh, burial place that they had prior. So he decided, when looking around, I, I, better use, I could use this material, it lasts forever. And thus he set a stone, limestone, and said, I'm going to build it out of this. But there were building uh, burial places out of uh, this wood in a square. So he decided, well, look, I'll just use a stone or stones and the same procedure, and that will last. But when he was finished, he said, gee, it's going to last, but it, it looks like nothing. So he decided to put uh, another layer on the top and recess them, set them back. And there were six of them set back, looked something like wet cake. They become steps, and thus the term step pyramid. This is the second at Abu Simbel, breathtaking to behold. You can't look at these and say they weren't Africans who were doing this. Why would they put somebody else's face? <laughs> Well, it's an artistic rendering. They didn't have equipment to make thin lips. 
and to make uh, no. Darado, so they had to use that and it wouldn't make, but then the little details of a fingernail, <laughs> they had the equipment for that, but not for the, for the, for the, for the thin lips. Is it important though to say that Africans did this? Oh yes, if, if no one had said the Africans didn't do it, it wouldn't be important. But since that had been said for no reason at all, they wanted to satisfy themselves that although they, didn't, they were not in history, that they did it. Now, since it is that the people whose ancestors did it could not say anything about it in the past, now is the time that they declare to the world whose legacy it is. <laughs> All four of these figures are of the same man, Ramesses II. Ramesses ruled for about 67 years, and he was an engineer, and, really? and is known to have commissioned not only that his, his West, his architect, was known to at many times had him come and do some supervision. Like our symbol, it said that he supervised the building of our symbol himself. So he was an engineer? He was also an engineer. He was a very accomplished man. So would he be qualified to be called a priest? Uh, he studied in the priesthood. He took the reign of his father in 1298 uh, uh, when his father died. Ah. And he ruled till 1232. Some people vary a, a few years one way or the other. Some say 1230, some say, but yeah, around two years isn't going to make a difference. How long did he live? He, li he ruled from 1298, according to Manito's figure, until 1232, 67 years. But how long did he live? He lived to be 100, uh, 98, something like that. 98 years? 98, 97 years old. And he had how many offspring, do you know? Well, <laughs> he had as many offspring as you got guides. <laughs> some <laughs> say this, so he had many wives, some said 200 offspring, somebody said 100 offspring, some 30, 40. I don't know, but quite a lot. And wives? <laughs> How many wives did he have? Quite a lot. Quite a lot. But who was his favorite wife? His favorite wife was Nefertari II. What would, what would possess somebody to look at something this magnificent and mark it up like that and defile it with their name? Eh? There are many factors. One, hate. <laughs> Two, hate. grudge. Uh, uh, four, their own smallness. And five, it's a means of saying, I did it. Now, in between these figures is a passageway. What's in there? Ah, that's to get into the temple. That is an actual temple with a hypostyle hall, although there are only four columns on each side. Uh, and then on the walls, you will see the wars that Ramesses II fought with the Hittites and others. Of course, none, no record of the war, any war with the Hebrews, none whatsoever. Right. And at the end of the corridor, there's a little chamber. What's that? There is what you call the antechamber. And the next chamber to that last would be the Holy of Holies or the sanctuary. Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies would have the triad. Like you have the Trinity. Yes. That's where the concept of ancient Egyptian in every city had a holy trinad, tri a triad, T-R-I-A-D. Three gods. Normally a god, a goddess, and a god. A god, the father, a goddess, the mother, and a god, the son. The holy trinity that Christianity adopted. You notice this side. These are supposed to be the Asian captives of war, of Ramesses II. You notice that? Mm -hmm. Carefully. Now let's shift side. These are supposed to be Nubians or generally Africans, but they are tied the exact same way as these on the side. Yet, in America, in the classroom, these are called Negro slaves of Ramesses. But these are called, in the same textbook, by the same professors, Asian captive or Semitic captives. Prisoners of war. No. no. Prison, yes, prisoner of war here. 
but slaves there. Now, what makes the difference? Oh, <laughs> gee, I can't possibly imagine. All right, my brother. Dr. Ben, what are we looking at here? What is he filming? That is the opet procession, the procession of the priests. And after Ramesses come back from war and he's victorious, it is the procession of the priests. Here, here is before God Pata is in front, Ramesses is in front of God Pata. Appealing for long life. What are we looking at? The war of the Hittites against Egypt. Ramesses pursuing and fighting the Hittites. If you notice, the figures show you the strictly African characters. So that's him on top of the chariot. Him and his chariot. And, the, and he's the, driving them out. Uh, yes, right. That's Ramesses slaying one of the enemies. And he wouldn't be slaying an ordinary soldier. He's slaying either the, the, the mayor or the king, but he don't be, it wouldn't be shown slain because his men killed the regular men. Who was he killing though? Oh, the Hittites. The Hittites. Hittites. And who were the Hittites? The Hittites are people from Asia. All right. And there he is again. That's right. And you notice. Waging war. That's right. Now. And there, there he is wearing a, a suit with a penis cup, by the way. That and is he's to protect his enemies. He's slaying the enemies. As we left, Dr. Ben explained that this magnificent temple was originally located much closer to the Nile River and was recently moved. So they had to raise this 100 feet up and back 600 feet. Five nations assigned their best engineers to move these temples to higher ground to avoid them being engulfed by the rising waters from the newly constructed Aswan Dam. The monuments could not be moved intact, so they were painstakingly cut into smaller blocks and reassembled at this present location. The rescue effort cost a then estimated $36 million and was hailed as an engineering miracle. And rightly so. But what then does one say of those who originally created all of this some 3,287 years ago? This is the temple of Nefertari. The second. The second. This was Ramesses' favorite. His most favorite what? This is Ramesses. And he lived to 99? About 97. 97, I'm sorry. Good night. Yes, I, I think he was that. Now, this is Ramesses again. This is Ra Ramesses. That's, and Ram a, and that's a goddess. That's, that's Hathor. Hathor, I can tell by the horns. <laughs> it's Ram that's that's Nefertari. And see the graffiti there, too. The mark of graffiti and them yeah. all over. It's going, sir. Typical of the behavior. Here, Dr. Ben, on this wall. The same thing, you have God Horus or, or blessing the king, and here again you have the uh, God Ptah also blessing the king, King Ramesses II. I Nefertiti see. in front of Ptah. Now, this is a now, goddess. Yes, no, it's by it's, her headdress. It's, uh, uh, but Nefertiti come in, in the person of goddess Hathor. I see. And paying honor to, to the king Pitar. What is this depicting here? She is uh, visiting Gade. She is again paying homage to goddess Hathor. Remember what I said? Hathor comes with the sun disc between the horn of the cow. Right. Now we know it's Hathor. If you put a little 
uh, chair, the throne, and the top, it becomes what? Osiris. Isis. Isis, I'm sorry. If you put a maze, it becomes her sister, Nephthys. How was this work done? With chisel? They gouged out, this is granite. Yeah. And they gouged it out. Uh -huh. They chiseled it out. Now, in some work, where they didn't chisel, they take the work and they put a thin layer of plaster. Yes. And when the plastic was damp, they put a cut, a, a, come up, a plate of the design, likely. Then they came and d draw it over it. But in this case, where they got the chisel into the material, it was done with hammer and chisel. And what about when, when in place, not on the ground? They first they put the stone up, then they do the finishing while it's up. Colors. Where did they get their colors from? Ah, from clay, from tree barks, and they flowers. made their own color. Flowers, different way. They made different and kinds of stain and dyes with the color. To last this long, huh? Oh, yes. Because they put it in the mortar, <laughs> and it goes in and penetrates. This was a place then for all people to come and worship. It's a temple. Worship but the temple. temple was in the name of Goddess Hathor. Goddess Hathor. Nefertari Temple for Goddess Het Heru. Goddess Hathor. Hathor or Het, listen, Het, wife Heru, wife of Horus. Now, what is the significance of the figures being seated? Well, the pharaoh was at rest and he's sitting on his throne. Okay. See, next to him, on his side is his throne. And because uh, Nefertari's feet are one in front of the other, she's alive. Oh, the whole thing is alive. And, and, and you know he's alive, he's sitting on the throne. The only how you would know that he's dead if he had the crossed his hands. No. Even if the foot together is sitting down, he has to have crossed his hand, which he would could do sitting down also, like an X. And then you will see the flail in one hand. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and the that crook, means, and the crook means, in the other. That means he's dead. He's dead. But he's one of the pharaoh who in real life had a beard. Because even in alive, they put a beard on him. Look at those lips. <laughs> There, I Look can, at that nose. Can you say I see my father there? <laughs> and his ancestors? I mean, there can be no doubt about it. However... That's not Charlton Heston. Yeah, no. <laughs> and, and, and the Fatari is not Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Thank you. I noticed that with, between his knees there are cartouches. What do they say? His name. Uh, Amen Mary Ra. Ah. Ra Mary Amen. Ramesses. Ra Mary Amen. So that's a standard that they established to identify themselves as the cartouche. The, the monarch was represented by the cartouche. If you don't see the cartouche, you can't. Uh, you might have seen a statue look exactly and say, this is so and so. You can't say it because it, there's no cartouche. To be. Sure, you must have the cartouche. But now to identify the god and the goddesses, you don't necessarily need the cartouche because oh. it's the head, yes. the headdress. Yes, that never changed for the... For one goddess is never shown with the other goddess uh, up here. It, in, you got to be careful in only three cases. Nefertari, I'm sorry. Isis or Aset. Yes. Het Heru or Hathor. And Nephthys. You got to be careful of them because they're represented with a cow's horn, all of them, and a disc in the, within the cow's horn. So how do you tell between? Uh -huh. On top the disc, you have a little throne. That's Isis. Yes. Without the disc, yes. it's Hathor. And yes. with a little maze, 
I saw it snapped this. this. I saw it. Right. <laughs> That's the way you tell one for the other. Because if, if you never, if you see it with one, it's impossible to be. If you see the 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 throne and the and the and the disc, it's impossible to be anybody else than ISIS. So and just if you, to, just to keep you alert, they they, they make you that, huh? they make you look <laughs> for that loan to see who it is. <laughs> Another temple that had been rescued from the rising waters created by the dam, the temple at Philae. What god is this temple uh, honoring? Maybe more so goddess. Goddess. Goddess Aset or Ast, otherwise called Isis. Isis is the sister of her husband, god Asaru, Asar, otherwise called Osiris. When was this built, and under whose uh, dynastic reign? Well, the earliest period for this will go back to the Roman period, the Greek period. Mm -hmm. And the Greek period doesn't start any earlier than 332 B.C., because the Greeks came to Egypt as conquerors during 332. But it didn't start at that particular time. It is supposed to have been started during around 70 or so, uh, before the Common Era. Before we get into uh, more of the religious meaning, just architecturally, this whole alignment, the alignment the of colonies. these columns is uh, just magnificent. And it's, an it's just an architectural wonder unto itself. Did it have a ceiling? Uh, was it covered? Yes, you could see some of the slabs there. It was all covered. But you would notice something else so that you could no no notice that this column over here isn't finished, isn't complete. Yes. That show you that all that beautiful thing you see, you notice that they're in different stages. They would bring the stone and put them in place. Then they would carve them. That's a very important note. But you also would note that there's a difference in the typical ancient Egyptian column as against these. These have made transformation in the design. I see. And whereas you will see, these are multiplicity of design concepts in there. And as you go up, you see the difference in change. Here you notice the one, the fluted part is very narrow. Yes. With, with three bands, four bands. Whereas a little further up, let's take the third one, the fluted column is wider. The flute at a uh, wider in dimension. I see what you... Now, are all temples including this one, basically the same in structure, that there's an anti-chamber and that goes back until you get to the Holy of Holies? Basically, they start out with a people's court, mm -hmm. open, and then if it's a large temple, it would be other courts with different pylons, or uh, that would be a pylon. There'd be inner pylons. Now, after that, there would be a hypostyle hall, hall of column, or what I was called a pillared hall, after that, there will be an anti-chamber, which would be prior to the Holy of Holies. Which now, is always at the end. The, generally, the Holy of Holies is the last room to the east. Most of the worship temples are on the east bank. Most of the funerary temples are on the west bank. And the reason for that is Ra rises, God, Ra rises in the morning and comes up in the east. In the night, Ra goes to the next world, go to sleep, and go down in the west. These two major edifices here, there are figures that were there, and they've been chipped away. Who was depicted here, and who chipped them away, and why? Well, the central figure in this, all of this is, in this particular uh, our temple, will be Goddess Isis. This is her temple. And when you look at this, you will see goddess Isis and other gods, god Horus, which, by the way, is her son. But you're, you're dealing with Horus, or Heru, as the proper name would be, at various periods of his life. You would see then uh, various gods, you see there, goddess uh, Hathor, which became the surrogate mother of God, Heru. So the story is going to give you, from here, you will see other phases of this, 
when you go to other temples. When we go inside, we will see that the uh, early Christians put set their cross, and they're going to put them on columns and on the walls. They set their, uh, temp their um, various instruments for worship, like uh, altar and so forth. You mean they commandeered this temple for their own uses? Right. They, they considered heathen and pagan, but they used the same heathen and pagan temple for their own church. This is the purification rites or baptism. And you see the water, symbolically the water, comprises of the ankh yes. and the wasp scepter. Both things together, in, intermittently, ankh, wasp scepter, ankh, wasp scepter, as the water. See, they're hanging down there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, and this Who is, the, is being baptized? The Pharaoh. Now, as we go back in here now, that is the, the altar of, that the Christians use. The but, original altar that the ancient Egyptian used, that has gone. But it was in that room that was known as the Holy of Holies. Holy of Holies or the sanctuary. And that was... In Only sense, the high priest. In a sense, then, that was violated. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. That is the most sacred part of the temple. Our tour was now in full stride as we left Aswan and headed north, that's down the Nile, toward the city of Luxor, with all its many important temples, as you will see in our next special edition. For a you in all the time that the ankh comes from the cross, not at all. There is an ankh, and there is a cross. Ankh there, and a cross to your left, and up. They, they mean two different things have always meant two different things. Never has one been an order. Outside the main temple are lesser temples. Now this is off of the main temple, which is behind us. What is this here? This is a kiosk. What's that? Or mean? a small little chapel. And it's the chapel belonging to goddess Hathor, Hetheru. Now, what's unique about this temple, if you come here, if you look at there. And you see God Bess. This was originally the original god of the Nile, god of the life, because the life was a life source. Now you see Bess playing every instrument there is. The harp, which you thought was a European instrument. Here is God Bless playing the tambourine. Here. Yeah. Here is God Bless playing the flute and the canobo. Here he is over there playing in the form of a monkey, playing what Farouk call the electric guitar. Here is it. Look, look, like any electric. Here he is playing a, a bassoon. Here, here, you see what I mean? He, he's playing all the major instruments that you thought were European. Why you say that? I knew that, I knew this a long time ago. Yeah, well, I just want to refresh your memory. <laughs> <laughs> the back of this lesser temple looks out on a lake created by the building of a dam, which would have engulfed the temple had it not been disassembled and moved to this higher ground. These are the remnants that they took out from that oh, old yeah, site. They, yes. And sooner or later, they're going to be restored somewhere oh, here. Oh, here. Mm -hmm. These remnants are going here. Uh -huh. Build this uh, temple here. They got 5,000 another island which they will also bring here as money come available. You know something? What I noticed here, there's some colors there. Yes. Of red and blue. Right. Right towards the top. And the back. Yes. You yes. Mean to tell some me of the original that brilliant blue color. I remember now that right up here this, towards the top. Yes. Yes. I remember that that and uh, some down by that the little roof there too. Yeah. And I remember and some here in different places. But remember this, this was mostly underwater all year round. We boarded a launch across the Nile to meet our bus to go to Luxor. We saw a hotel that was in business during British rule. Dr. Ben was barred from staying here at that time. And then we were on our way to historic Luxor. It stops along the way at two important temples laden with information, as you will see. The 
This is the temple of Komombo, the double temple of the crocodile-headed god Subic and the falcon-headed god Harois. When was this built and uh, who built it? This was originally a temple before the Roman period and the Greek period. However, when the Greeks came as conquerors, they ordered a temple be built here, and this also called the Roman, uh, the Greek period, and that was done by the Ptolemies. Is this the same concept in all the temples that you go back, back into different? Yes and no. Yes and no. The open court, the hypostyle hall, the antechamber, and the Holy of Holies, but this is a double temple. What you have on one side, you also have on the other side. So you have two Holy of Holies in this temple. I see. Now I see Horus. And this is a good shot of the baptism, isn't it? Yes. There you have, in this case, there you have Horus, or Horakti, and you have the Pharaoh, the Ptolemy, and you have the god of scribes, the god of historians, and that will be Tahuti. The Greeks call him Thot. Are these original colors here? Oh, those are some of the original. That, that goes oh. back to the original. Boy, this must have been just gorgeous. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is the purification rites, or baptism of the Pharaoh. This is the god Tahuti, sometimes called Thut, if you're using from the Greek way. He is holding the jar, the goblet, with the holy water, and on the opposite side is Harois, holding another. They're pouring the holy water over the Pharaoh. Which Pharaoh? This is Ptolemy 11th, or, right. or Ptolemy 12th. You notice that the holy water is made up of ankh and was scepter. Ankh, was scepter, ankh, was scepter. The ankh is the key of life, a symbol of the key of life. The was scepter is the highest authority of the king. So baptism didn't take place when you were an infant? Oh, no. Well, baptism goes back for thousands of thousands of years, long before the story of Jesus and, and John the Baptist. But, the, but uh, contrary to the way we've been taught to think of baptism, it took place when you were grown. Oh, yes. You know, what's it the next? The next is the uh, preparation of the coronation scene with the uh, putting of the crown and the pharaoh's head. And here you have the god Nith and goddess put in, the gods, goddesses, Nith and another one, put in the, the crown on the king's head. And Horus, witness it, Horus is carrying the was scepter. You remember you just saw the was scepter in the, yes. in the thing? This is the highest authority, the word was scepter. And you can see that's Horus because it's the head of the falcon. He's carrying the head of the falcon on the head, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the disc of a god uh, Ra on the head. And here you have Goddess Hathor and the Queen Cleopatra. This is Cleopatra. Cleopatra. One of the better uh, image of her that you would see. It's not around. too not too much like Liz Taylor though. Oh no, not at all. <laughs> and the hair. Yeah, not not at all. That is actually um, you could see coarse hair curl up. And then here is God Horus again. Over on the right, oh, yes. Uh, yes. Horus, in this case. <laughs> Dr. Ben, what is this? This is, a, is an ancient calendar uh, of the times when they was based upon the lunar, the lunar calendar. If you would notice, it is based upon the moon and then the sun. For instance, one, two, three, four, four, and four is eight, the month, eight month. This would be two, four, five, the fifth month. The fourth, see, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth month. See, 
the eleventh month, and so forth, so that you know what year it was, what month. Did they have uh, the 365 about. day? 365 and a quarter day, corrected each fourth year. But they had a 13 month calendar. There was 12 months of 30 days each, and one month of five days. Here is another scene. This is very important because it shows the Pharaoh paying homage to goddess Isis, or goddess Asset, sitting on a bird chair. What do you mean, what, a bird chair? What do you mean? She, this is how deliveries were made from a, a stool like that? Right. And if you notice her breast, yeah, it's full. Yes. Full of uh, lactation for when she has a baby. And notice again that the stomach is large, yes, showing yes. that she, she is pregnant. But equally, you notice they were prepared just in the event that she had any trouble. Here is the surgical instrument. If she had running into trouble. Oh, these are uh, yes. surgical scissors. Scissors, the knives, the scalpel. The scalpel up here. Up there. You have those little things that they use the to hold. Retractors. Retractors and everything like that. Isn't that something? Uh, those were old instruments. And here is the man, Imhotep, who used to be the great... Uh, Sakara, the step That's brother. right. And look at this, where you used to wash Thank the you. hand. To keep, you see, they said that Pasteur, and Madame Curie and all of them started to think about cleanliness. This is way back there. One had to wash one hand but before I'm one committed surgery. You know what I noticed about these temples? They've been worked and reworked and reworked over. Right, so they were a different period. And each period they did their own thing on it. Uh, somebody came and either occupied it or oh, continued. What's and this? What's if you this? notice all the way down, the water would come in from the river. And this is a Nile-ometer or Nile-o-meter. My, my, my. So, you could see the different level as the water darkens the around the rim here. So the crocodile would come. They would get the crocodile come in, and they'll catch the largest and the strongest cut crocodile, and keep it here in with the in the Nile meter. Plus, they will know when the high tide. They will know when the flood is coming down, because this will get higher and higher. And since the rains come in Ethiopia and Uganda around July and August, by September it would come, but they would see it when it's coming because... Oh, in advance. Because it, the water would rise. Oh, this would uh, sort of forecast. It. Right. And they would also be able to tell the taxes, ah. the taxation based upon the height of the water. Ah. Means how much water they're going to get and how much silt they're going to go up. They, they know from just here in the meter. You know something... While I have you here, I've noticed that in the tour groups, I haven't seen many tour groups of color here. No. Uh, in 1957, there was one. I introduced the first one in 1957, a few professors, as a matter of fact, it was nine people. And I kept bringing 10, 9, 5, things like of that number. The first large group came in 1978. Eight. It was a group from you brought? California I brought. Uh, they came from Watts, the Penan uh, Institute out there, uh, medical group, it was by Dr. King and others, and they, they were called a NUS group. Well, without getting into too much detail, my question is, why don't we see many groups here of color? Even to this day, 1994, because our people have been given a bill of goods that only the western part of Africa we could relate to. We've been trained that way by the school system, by the churches, 
by the synagogues, the mocks, and everything, that we had nothing to do with this part of the world. And that's been the mission of your life, to that's correct that. It's to show it, quite to the contrary. All right, let's press on. So. Our next stop was at the huge temple at Edfu. This is the big one. It's the biggest singular temple except for Karnak. Karnak, Warit. Uh, because Warit is a series of temples within a temple. How many pharaohs added and were involved with this temple? Eight. Eight? <laughs> That's all? That's all. Ramesses had his hand in here. Oh, yes, everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's no place that he didn't have a hand. All right, so there is... The pharaoh. The pharaoh Bre Thor. Pharaoh Brit in Horus. Yep. So you got it down, Horus. That's it. I'm, listen, don't mess up the kid. I know now. <laughs> you beat me up and up, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You will notice that the architecture is the same kind of thing with a quadrangle. And then you have your series of columns. The series of columns here follow the pattern that you will see in uh, Abydos. The, the columns, the colonnades as a part of the courtyard. You will see colonnades here as a, the same type of colonnades in when you get to uh, Luxa, in the temple at Luxa in Warit, you see the colonnades. In addition to being a place of worship and a place to document their stories and their religious uh, stories, uh, did the pharaohs and the priests live here? They live in next to the uh, palaces where they were going to be buried. What do you mean palaces? The, the king's palace was where the burial uh, place would be, more than we where the worship, they never, they never lived where the worship temples were. Why haven't we seen any of the palaces? They we don't survive? We haven't been to a mortuary pa palace yet. Uh -huh. All the palaces we've been gone thus far is worship temples. When we go to the West Bank, we have not been in the West Bank yet. Do you have any idea why these courtyards are so huge? Ah, well, they built monuments to the deity. They were building to the deity, and they built large, colossal things to the deity, to say to the deity, I pay tribute to you. Now, how did they get up there to do the inscribing? Well, on the edifices there. Well, that was easy. They built scaffold. That was easy. When they get up to there, they would build a scaffold and they had ramps. What we are looking here is a dramatization of the story of Horus revenging the murder of his father by his uncle. You would notice that he lands Harpoons, the hippopotamus representing his father because he's a god and you can't show a god being killed. So this hippopotamus is symbol. the symbol of the bad god, which is his uncle, Seth Typhon. And what do we have over he, here? He turns up the, the animal, hippopotamus, but they continue the struggle with the bad god. The hippopotamus. There it is, see? And he harpoons him. All right. Continue down, and as you see, the different gods and goddesses in the story. Him. They're assisting him. Because, right. remember, they're killing the evil god. This was a treacherous murder. It's a treacherous murder. He had killed his un uncle two times. This is the second time. First, he hanged his uncle. The second time, he had hung him again, but cut him up into two pieces, uh, I'm sorry, 14 pieces. The one piece that was missing was missing because it had been eaten by the Nile catfish, but that we will see elsewhere. Here, they are being greeted. See the ladies hitting 
tambourine is greeted coming in here and he has already killed Horace. Now here, the, over here to the left, is the hippopotamus. Much bigger now. Much bigger. And here, but one thing I want to bring to your attention, he kills him with a harpoon. Yes. Yet they told us in school that the Swedes invented the harpoon. This, they know Sweden when this story is. They know Sweden when they made this temple. And yet we have a harpoon. So somebody had a harpoon long before the Swedes had it. The top are of Hathor, is that correct? Yes. All of it. In and there. Uh, all, of these faces. all of the calm heads are Hathor. In order to, to um, hack away and chisel away all of this work, uh, those who did it had to erect scaffolding. Uh, most of them erected ladders because scaffolding they didn't have as much material, but they made, they had little scaffolding, but most of it was done with ladders. The point I'm trying to make is that it took a lot of effort. Oh yes. To really do such damage to this magnificent temple. The time they took to do this, they could have built their own building. The point is that they condemned this building, they destroy the things in there, and then use the building. They call the big building pagan, and the people pagan, and heathen, and all, all that. But they use the same building that they condemn as pagan. But well, you, you can't show MGM movies in a Paramount building. They take some water and call it holy water, sprinkle it around, say a few prayers, and that makes the pagan building become a good Christian building. Okay. This is what, uh, some sort of a... This is a chapel, a small I... chapel. And as a matter of fact, it's a chapel of Goddess Newt. How do you spell that? N-U-T. Uh, pronounced right. Newt. Some people write it N-O-U-T. And what is the significance of this? The ceiling? If you look, you would notice Goddess Newt's head here, her hands hanging down there, her body comes this way, her foot goes down, down, and then you see the sun, God rock, comes as the sun, sun with all its rays. And the rays coming from her, the sun comes out of her vagina, and the rays go over Goddess Hathor. Hathor holding the tree of life, and her head is staying on a mountain. Then you see the, the sun going back in the night as the moon and going back through her body. She takes it back through her mouth. It goes again around her body and comes out through her vagina constantly so because the, the world cycle, never ends. The whole cycle of life then? As yes, sir. world never ends. It revolves around the female. Do? Yes. This is a sundial. It was made for the room to tell time. How does it work, you know? Well, the sun cast a shadow in here, and they had a, 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 a compass for the time of the world. And the sun would, as it moves up to the fulcrum, it would cast a shadow, and they could tell what time of the day it was. So all of that is long gone. Yes. That's How did you know then that it was this? Well, it was here, and we knew seen it in other, other temples and know what this is. I see. And all you right. notice, by the way, the faces of Hatta yes. is all gone again. I can tell by the cow ears, but the, again, it's all the face. And the, and, the, and, the, and the hair. These are keys which indicate wall. In other words, this is what the, yeah. there was the a column wall. was anchored into. The, these there was a wall here. See the wall? Yeah. Were you sitting on this is it, huh? That's right. That was weird. See that? Ah, uh, I see. There was a wall this wide. These were anchored 
I see. A wall this way. And there's other keys on top of that, so this wall was quite high. Went, went up. Wow. See, because they had to earthquake, they had to anchor these stones. They could just put one in and depend on the weight. You had earthquake. So they used the key, but never mortar. No, no mortar. Wow. Egypt is the mother of war, the Western world civilization. It didn't start here. It started where Himnopha said at the beginning of the Nile, but it reached its zenith here. The whole world must look to Egypt. The entire world, bar not a single country, every high culture must come here for the beginning of what they are. I don't care if it's Jewish, if you're Christian, or you're Muslim, if you're Greek, or you're Roman, you must come here. There, here is where it started, along the Nile, and here it, re it reaches Zenith. If you're talking about Avram, Abraham, you're talking about uh, uh, Moses, they, they were here. Moses, was, they said, was born here in a place called Goshen. Abraham came here and received his education. He had no education before he came here. All of them came here. The, the, the whole thing about the Ten Commandments came out of the 42 negative confessions. Dr. Ben is teaching reverse racism. They call it what they want. They could, I don't mind what they call it. The fact is, if a teacher come here and prove me wrong, I'll go any way they got and show them what they wrote, where it came from, and carry them to where it came for them to see it. The point is, my evidence still exists. They can't show me Adam, Adam and Eve, but I could show them Osiris. set out across the Nile for the Valley of the Kings on the West Bank. We passed through a small village and got a different kind of visual treat. It was market day. We got a chance to look at the everyday folk of today's Egypt. But our business was history. This is the temple of Ramesses III and others. But well, what's unique about this guild is that the first, the oldest first started is still here. You gotta be kidding. Yeah. A flush the, toilet. Yes, I'm gonna show yeah. you. Where? When we go, go here. here. Go into the next section. As a matter of fact, you still, still spend the doo-doo. Yes, sir. Now how did that work? Now. There was a bucket up here, and they will tilt the bucket when the person is finished. It was also a shower here. I see. And then when they tilt the bucket, it would flush the water. As you notice there, there's a yes, trough. It's a trough. This will go down, and, and there's there a hole down there. The water will run out and go into a flush system. And how old is this? This goes back at least the 20th dynasty, about 1100 and add before the common era before Christ. 1100 before Christ. Uh, where was Rome at that time? Didn't exist. A hundred years at least before there was a Rome or Greece. Interesting. Interesting. Now this is a side of the temple, Dr. Ben. But boy, is this dug out deep. Why? They did that to avoid destruction by the people who came and defaced temples. So they make this very deep. If you, even the attempt to deface it in terms of this death was done. You have, right away you got your hand, you just touch the a scene from the Nile. See the different type of yeah, fish. Yeah, there's a duck chasing the fish. That's right, and you can see the different types. Uh, I a, see. A mullet, uh, a snapper and so forth. But this was really designed to uh, frustrate anybody who wanted to deface. deface the property. In other words, they had experienced it already. Oh yes, he's, he's come now in the 20th he who? dynasty. Ramesses III. Ramesses he's in the, the 20th third. dynasty. And all, he's had at least all the way from the, the, the temples going back to the 17th dynasty all the way has been so defaced. So most of the figures in this temple then are cut deep like this. Oh yes. Oh, yes. Okay, well, then let's go inside the courtyard again. Lord, what a huge 
huge, huge, huge court. Now, where are we now? That is the colonnade with statues. Every one of those statues is a finger of Ramesses III. And you notice he, he used the same method of presenting himself and his sons My. as Ramesses II did. This is huge. Yes. This is just... It's colossal. Colossal. And when you consider, it goes all the way back in the gill. How long That's, did it take to do this? And where did they get the, the stones from? Well, local all the way stone. Back in Aswan? No, the marble. Where you use marble, that came from Aswan. Where you use the limestone, it came from the local quarries. Now, what would this courtyard be used for? The multitudes, the common people would the come here as they, they're called? The common people come and the priests, the, yeah, and the priests address them. All right, but could the masses go any further inside? No, they'll stop here. Now, on the right here, on this wall, which is just off this huge courtyard, the faces look, they don't look African on the right here. Those are ancient people. Are these and the invaders? These are the invaders. As a matter of fact... And they're bearing arms. Yeah, yeah, but they're not the invaders in this particular case because Ramesses went to Asia and fought them. They had invaded before. They're forced back and now Ramesses pursue them so that they are fighting now an Asian territory. All right, but now as you move further to the left, you see that they're actually meeting in combat here. You, the but one then, has a sword. You, you notice that the distinct difference in features. Well, as the, you move to the left, right, yes. You then see at the, where the two combatants meet together, you see one is an Asian and one is an African. You see African with long pleated hair. You notice the face, the, the facial, the, lips and the nose and the lips, so you got no doubt. Yeah. And they're wrestling there. And they're, they're wrestling, they're fighting. Uh, but some are falling, others are standing up. The battle is going on. The Africans fighting for Egypt and the Asians fighting for Persia. What is the significance uh, of looking at this? The significance for me in this particular case is to show that there were Africans and the Egyptians were fighting as Africans, and they fought people as Asians. ...of a statue of Ramesses II, which weighed over 100,000 tons intact. We also saw workmen who were working to restore this funerary temple site. This funerary temple was where Ramesses II's corpse was prepared for burial. And Dr. Ben also showed us some Roman arches that weren't built by Romans. Those are archways for the granary. When the Pharaoh Ramesses II had his complex for the men who were working here, they had a granary where they could store their food and everything. What and is the significance of looking at this? The significance is looking at it to see that in architectural and art school today, they teach that these arch, arches are Roman arches and are Greek arches. And this arch, these arches existed before there was a Rome or a Greece. Ramesses died in 1232 BC, and Rome or, or Greece wasn't built until at least 1000 BC. And then Dr. Ben threw us a curve. In the Valley of the Kings, he showed us a temple for a queen. Now, Queen Hatshepsut is one of the few women who were pharaohs. The only woman who ruled as a pharaoh. Other women rule that queen, but she's the only woman to rule as a queen and a king simultaneously. She claimed she was not born of an ordinary person, but she was the daughter of a god and a goddess. And that gave her the right to rule as a king and as a queen. What god did she worship? Did she recognize Ra? 
Yes, Amun-Ra, everyone. And the only person who did not worship Ra, per se, was Akhenaten, but everybody did. Amun-Ra, she said, was her father. Uh, one of the wonders of this uh, Temple of Hatshepsut is where it was selected, because it's in sort of a cove, isn't it? It is right up against the mountain. If you went inside, you will find that it goes into the mountain. This is the Hippostel Hall or of the chapel. The chapel is in that door where you can't go in. You used to be able to go in, but you can't go in anymore. So all of this was enclosed at one time? Oh, yes. It had a ceiling? Oh, yes, and had a ceiling. It's like a Hippostel Hall. I see. And you notice they ramp up. It yes. ramps up. Yes, yes, yes. It was high. It was high up to the... To high, the high up. up. It went right in there. Right. It we went can't higher. get in there now. Like, no. And behind that door was the signature of her architect. Simut. Simut. Which they got a rumor. A rumor. I want to emphasize. Rumor. There's no written proof that she had an affair with her architect. Holy of Holies is in the back? Well, no. In, if you could use a such shrine... There's no Holy of Holies. This is a funeral temple. I see. There wouldn't be. I no. understand. You could look to the right, to the left there. You will see that. And, then you, and every one of these columns, you see the Hathoric head. And four, all four sides. Who is this up here? Where? On the that's, next level. That's her husband. Uh, Tutmosis II. That's Tutmosis. You see, her father, you got to know a little history about her how great she was. When the Hyksos were here, that's the first foreign conquerors of Egypt. Mm. She they came up to them? They came from Asia, around the Oxus River. They came and destroyed the 13th dynasty and started the 14th. By the time of the 17th dynasty, dynasty people here, kings from here, a man by the name of Amus, Amus I, got mad and organized the forces against the Hyksos. To drive them out. To drive them out. He got killed on the battlefield, and his son, Totmus I, mm -hmm. took over. Continued the fight. Continued the struggle. He got killed on the battlefield. His daughter, who, was, who took after him, took over above the second because you were too young. She took over the battle and pursued the Hyksos. That daughter would be Hatshepsut. Makari Hatshepsut. She was a rough lady. She was a strong woman. She brought women in the government in certain positions, but she did not allow women to interfere with the priesthood, to go into the priesthood. They developed their own system called the priestess, but they were not allowed to participate with the men. Yes. I know we are in Queen. Plus the fact, plus the fact, Gail, she started what is today you called Women's she... Liberation. Oh, yeah, brother. Women's li... Today we call Women's Liberation Movement. She had done it thousands of years before. Amen. That's what I like to say. Two tombs here that are known of, perhaps the best known of which is the all but vacant tomb of Tutankhamun best known because the boy pharaoh's tomb was discovered intact in the early 1900s. Egyptians working under an Englishman named Howard Carter came quite by accident upon a few steps leading downward, this in November of 1922. Carter was contacted and he ordered the digging to continue. They found the tomb of King Tut, a sensational find. The treasures of this tomb were brought out into daylight for the first time in thousands of years. Works of solid gold, alabaster, and other precious minerals fashioned into exquisite works, intended not for the eyes of the living, but to accompany the young king on his journey to the afterlife. Then Dr. Ben and I took a look at the tomb of Ramesses IV. If you would look at the ceiling, uh, Gil, you see, there are different examples from 
the papyrus, the very papyri you see, like the papyrus of Annie and so forth, and the wall quotations from the various holy books. Goddess Ma'at to recite the 42 admonitions to, to her, otherwise called the negative confessions. From which came? From which came 10 of them came, it's, uh, it's called the Ten Commandments. Moses supposed to have gotten it on Mount Sinai, but he could, I don't know who he could get that when it was already been taught to everyone in Egypt at the education system at Luxa. Luxa was then called what set. The Greeks came and changed that name to Thebes. The Arabs came and changed it to Luxa. What we're not looking at, though, is the architectural achievement. This passageway and this whole t tomb is cut into the side of a mountain. It's cut into the side of a mountain, and then it is smooth, then it is ca uh, carved, and then painted into the beautiful colors you see here. Wait, they had to know what they were doing as far as tolerance. They had architects and en engineers. This wasn't haphazard guesswork. And what is this, this, uh, what is this, the tomb S actual? Sarcophagus. Sarcophagus. And where the body was put into. It's hermetically sealed. That's the big one, and there was a smaller one inside of that big one. So the, plus the uh, uh, wrappings that the body was in and kept the body for thousands of years. And this is the tomb of Ramesses IV. Ramesses IV, one of the Ramesside kings. The Valley of the Kings looks down on a flatlands area that is almost level with the Nile River. And in this area stands a huge colossus of the pharaoh Amenhotep III. This pharaoh sired a son who would have a major impact on the religious concepts of succeeding civilizations because this son, Amenhotep IV, also known as Akhenaten, formulated the concept of one supreme god, known as monotheism. These gigantic colossus were carved out of a single piece of sandstone. Dr. Ben and his accompanying guide talk to me about these colossus. Why are these colossus so far away from the Valley of the Kings? Yes, they were in front of the temple, the funerary temple. That time being 18th dynasty, they have been constructed temples so far to mislead the grave robbers. Tell me something. Do you ever have the feeling that they haven't found all the tombs? I, they found the 62 of one period, but there are other pharaohs missing of other periods. And nobody knows where they're buried? No, or they could be anywhere in Egypt because... Uh, uh, digging in Egypt by luck, <laughs> yes. by chance, like how a Carter has been discovered, King Tut by uh, luck. Uh, but Sherlock. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, it was uh, Sheikh um, Ram, Abdul. Ram Abdul, Abdul Raman, his, his father. Yes. was the one that found the tomb. And Howard Carter get the credit. The credit, yeah. Is it true uh, what they're saying, that uh, Howard Carter turned out to be a grave robber himself? All of that them. That he kept some of it for himself? All, all of <laughs> them kept for themselves. <laughs> kept for themselves. And they sold yes. to museums, and they kept for themselves, and they sold to museums. But they blamed the people who were equally robbing the tombs. But when they robbed the tombs, they didn't keep the monument, the um, artifacts to themselves. Somebody got it, it's and, they, and they don't have it, so somebody got it. Dr. Ben told us that most tombs and funerary temples, where the bodies are readied for burial, were located on the west bank of the Nile because the sun sets in the west. On the east bank were the temples of worship for the living, such as those directly opposite the Valley of the Kings, one of which is the largest worship temple ever built. Just wait till you see it. It's on the west bank of the Nile in the city of Luxor. This hour begins on the east bank, where Dr. Ben took us to two important temples in Luxor, one of which is described by Dr. Ben as the largest temple ever built, anywhere, at any time, as you will see. Two temples first. This were built by three main pharaohs. The first was Amenhotep III, then his son 
Akhenaten, then Ramesses the second. All right, now, as we turn around, we'll see the main entrance to this temple that this walkway leads into. This was the training temple for the priests. Here was where men came at age seven. He remained and for 40 years. 40? At, yes, to complete. The training of the priest took 40 years. One could not be a priest unless he was 47. What could entail such a long period of study? Uh, he, he learned the seven liberal arts, engineering, science, mathematics, medicine, law, theology, you name it. The people didn't come here. They, 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 they didn't come in here for anything. Only the priests came in here, the young training priests. The Colossus is Ramesses II. Both of them? Yes. So he had a hand in this too? Oh, yeah, he built this section. He built from where the Colossus is to the front. Aha. Uh -huh. He had this section on. Right. This section that changed, you notice the, the, the angle of the main access line. Now, beyond, beyond these Colossus, we see these long, tall columns. Hippostyle Hall, the Hall of Columns. And what is that, what went on in there? That's the aisle to go through. Just the passageway? The passageway. What was the relationship between the priest and the pharaoh? The priest was, the, the chief priest was the advisor of the pharaoh, and the priests were under the domination of the chief, chief priest, not the pharaoh. They related to the chief priests. So these priests had a lot of power. They, had, they, they were the people of knowledge. They advise the aristocrat or, 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 the, or the pharaonic system. They were the head of the educational system, which the Greeks call the mystery system. Now again, I see this passageway begins to ascend, which means we're headed towards the Holy of Holies. Yes, in a sense, that is true in its total sense. However, this particular chamber doesn't move you directly into the Holy no, of Holies. Not yet. No, no, uh -huh. but I can see up ahead. Yes, you go into the colonnade, the court of the colonnades, the court of the priests, where the priests assemble those in training, and they would walk around these colonnades. You see uh, columns on three sides, double columns, where there's a walk. It's called the colonnade, the colonnade of the priests. Now these columns are fluted. These are fluted papyrus columns, as you see in front of you. Yes. This is the Holy of Holies. When the early Christians came in and occupied this, they painted scenes from the Christian religion. Look at on the wall. Some of them are still remaining. You can oh, see I some can of the scenes. But I can see some of the scenes, yes. Right. And all of they painted this also. And they did it over the original. Uh, oh, yes. Yes. I see. You could see some of it is gone now, and they painted over the originals. When we start to enter here, you see certain quote-unquote Gothic arches with the early Christian use. They took, look at that. Look at that uh, piece of column where it's upside down. Look at the foot, the legs. They didn't worry if, even how they put it. That's upside down. They use the stone from another temple. What about this, uh, this concave entranceway here? Who built that? That was done during the Roman time. They tried to make the imitation of what the Romans had developed by this time. And they put you that there. What, what the Africans had developed by this time? But what the Africans had developed, they added to it. I see. When we left the Luxor Temple, Dr. Ben and I walked down a long avenue of sphinxes with ram's heads that once connected the Luxor Temple to the awesome temple of Karnak. So huge and beautiful, it's difficult to describe. It is a temple that started way back in the 12th dynasty. Under which pharaoh? They are not certain. However, it was really Zoom work was resumed on it on the in the 18th dynasty by 
Amenhotep III. Okay, now this is the main entrance, and these are the figures of Amun-Ra. Uh, in the form of a ram's, ram's head. head, a lion body. Standing between the two paws is God Amun-Ray. And this is the main entrance, my God. It's the main pylon. As you notice, these stone, the pylon, this thing was even touched good. Because you see the rough Over stone, here. see? It was rough stone all over, see? Now, this is done this side more than that side. But even so, there's hardly any work done comparatively because they had to smooth out this temple here. And why? Because the work, you place the stone in place first. Then you do the finished work. And they never got to do that. They never got to do it. Okay. I mean, it would, it would, take, it would take another century for them to do, finish this temple. This is one huge temple. Yes, it's the largest worship temple in the entire world. You can take St. Patrick's Cathedral, St. John the Divine, both in New York. You could take the Canterbury Cathedral. You could take the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. All of them and put them together and run almost the Indy 500 and still got room. <laughs> see, look, as That's far it. as your eyes can see. Now, what is this? This is the first courtyard. This is the first courtyard that was the mud ramp that as you carried the rocks up as you go up you lengthen the ramp and you can build you carry up the rocks up there could it be then that this is the same way the pyramids were made exactly the construction to build very high they did it by ramps you keep the same angle so as you go higher you lengthen the ramp that you do, you keep the same angle. Okay, now let's talk about some of these figures. There's a huge column here. What is that? These columns were built by Tihaka, the pharaoh that came here from Ethiopia, one of the Ethiopian pharaohs. I see. Now, guarding the entranceway, there, there are two statues, and they are... Ram they represent death. At this least one, one of them this represent one represent life. Life, that, that death. That one represent death. Of which person? Ramesses II. Ah, there he is again. Yes, right. All right. And then there, of course, is the ram's head with the lion's head. Ram's head. All the way around. Same and as the ram's head you saw outside. And this is an anteroom. No, uh, uh, no. Uh, that's the temple of God Amun. The specific temple. See, the whole thing is the great northern temple of Amun. But that particular one is the temple, the specific temple of Amun himself. So this is a, this temple is huge, but it is a conglomeration of many temples. Right. All right, now when we leave this enormous courtyard and walk down here, what are we going to see? Well, we go into the Hippostyle Hall. You're going to see 134 columns. 50 feet tall each and about seven to eight feet in diameter. God. Uh, all stone. You're going to see all kinds of carvings in it, but in particular here, Gil. Right up there, you see God Min that I spoke to you about. Yes. Here is it. And on every of one of these 134 columns, You'll be looking at God Min. Everywhere. The God of fertility. And elsewhere. He dominates this because Ramesses the second, though he followed many. He followed Akhenaten father. Akhenaten father was the first in the in the eighteenth dynasty to continue this 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 temple. These columns supported a ceiling. This was enclosed at one time. Yes. If you will notice, there is a low ceiling and there is a high ceiling. Yes. At that section was the low ceiling and you would notice 
right looking between these two columns, you would see a kind of grid pattern yes. going from the low column on top. That, you see the column here? Yes, yes. The beam across. Yes, yes. Then you see built up is the grid pattern to the higher column. How that allow you to get light in at the side. And both there were uh, roofs. There was the low roof and the high roof. And there's oh. some of the original colors. Oh, <laughs> yes. And you would see the original columns under that beam. And you should see some of the original color under this beam. At least a little piece there. There is it. See? Yeah. We're holding this. And then you see original color under that beam over there also at the high Tell roof. me something. Why do some columns end when scoop out like a flower and then some are straight up because some of the work wasn't finished and this is the papyrus form column you got to because this is in the south the column the capitals of the column are made like a lotus flower if you when you go to the north the capitals of the column are made like papyrus unless they got what they call the mix uh -huh. ca uh, uh, capital where they integrate both papyrus and lotus or other design. And you know what's also astounding is how well laid out these columns are. Oh yes. The, when you, uh, when you, if you went, look, all at that, look at that line there, it's perfect. Yes, but if you went in the center here, you would notice that if you went in the center here, you would notice Gil, if you went in the center here, you would notice a complete, from the end of the building to the other end of the building, right down there. there's a straight tube, perfectly aligned. Just as this one, it forms somewhat of a cross. Yes. You go straight down through the entire temple, that would be west to east. Or you go down from north to south, the entire color, uh, temple. Amazing. Just amazing. This is about uh, six stories tall. Well, uh, 15 feet, 5 feet per 10 foot is a floor. From floor to floor is 10 feet, and that's one floor. Mm -hmm. You got 50 feet, that's five, five floors. floors. Five stories. Five stories. No mortar. No mortar. If you notice the... Tell me, there's a good example of the car. The original column, the face there. There's no mortar. The joints are perfectly as if they were sanded. When we were at the uh, Ram Museum, we were looking at the, one of the bases. Yes. And there was a little hole. Uh, a key. And that's a key. A key. And that's, that was used to anchor. That each. was to anchor the stone. Just in the event of hurricane, uh, not a hurricane, <laughs> uh, earthquake, that the temp if it didn't shake, it wouldn't move. It would act as if it was one solid piece. So you're looking at master engineers, engineers. master architect. Oh yes, master uh, craftsmen of, the, of their period, and uh, up to today they would be masters. And a magnificent uh, religion. Oh uh, yes, religious. Oh yes, philosophy the, of these, peace. These were the founders of religious theosophy used today by Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. They have not gone beyond it. They're still using the fundamentals that were established along the Nile and best expressed here in this temple. Yes. In addition to the religious theology that was embodied here, there's just a sense of peace and tranquility that is absolutely overwhelming. of a god for whom this magnificent temple was named. That is a relief of God Amun-Re, holding an ankh in his 
left hand, the ankh is the symbol of the key of life, and in his right hand, he has the highest symbol of office, the was scepter. In front of him is Ramesses II, the pharaoh, giving him a gift of something to drink. Now these are awesome obelisks, yes? Which is a Greek name, is it not? Yes, it means uh, a needle-like pyramid. In fact, you notice on the top, shapes like a pyramid. And that used to be col color by coated with silver and gold. Really? Yes, they call it electron. Are these two related in any way as far as religion is concerned? Or? Yes. That one is the column. The, the one on the right? Yes, the oblique of Makari Hatshepsut. Yes. And this is of her son-in-law, Tutmosis III. The same Hatshepsut queen who we saw, right? That's, uh, had, had, uh, she was Shirin at 1580 to 14, uh, 50 something. Where was this granite brought from? Aswan, uh, uh, which is about four and a half hours drive from here, south. Four and a half hours drive? By, yes, by automobile. And there was no driving in those days. No, well. So they brought it up on barge. It came up on the Somehow boats. Somehow they got it out of the quarry. Out the quarry. Got it down to the river. Down to the river. Put it on a barge that was large enough. This is one piece. That's one right. One solid one piece. One solid monolithic piece. How much does it weigh, would you say? Oh, I mean, a few thousand tons. What does the shape of the obelisk represent? It represents a tapered uh, penis. It, frankly, it goes back to the story of Isis, using the Greek name, Aset would be the Egyptian name, put in erecting a symbol of her husband penis because her husband, Asar, or otherwise called Osiris, was murdered by his brother, Set Typhon. It was also Aset's brother. That's that story we saw on the wall. Right. With and, the hippopotamus. Right. And when he was murdered, and cut up into 14 pieces, she went and found find the pieces symbolically around the world, but could not find one piece, the penis, because his brother had thrown the piece, that piece in the Nile, and the Nile catfish ate it. So she had them built or cut an obelisk to remind those who had persecuted and murdered him of his penis, so that whenever they go, they'll always have to see his penis. I see. You would notice that it's George Washington Memorial in Washington, D.C. is a copy of this. So what are you saying to me? That it's a symbol of his penis. Not George's, but... George, the President of the United States, the obelisk is symbolic of the penis regardless of who got one. It has one meaning. Now, why? I wonder Be what George would say. Well, you know why? Every member of the United States, original Congress, and members of the cabinet of the United States, the first cabinet, was a Mason except one man, Benjamin Franklin, because he was a Quaker. What does and that have to do with what we're talking about? The, the, the symbols they use for setting up the United States was based upon the Masonic order of the, which they copied from here, the 22 tablets that were stolen from here by England. They used those tablets and used... Take for instance, and is the pyramid included in some, oh, I mean, oh yes. the obelisk? The pyramid and the money, like you said it. And the obelisk? The obelisk, the ever-seen eye, which they call the, the, the um, some funny name for it. The pyramid, the sunburst, is symbolic of God, amun Ra and Ra. Uh, the, Goddess uh, Ma'at at the Supreme Court building uh, with a scale, only that the scale with uh, Ma'at is level. The scale in the United States up and down. Not just this, but ju just this. Not just this. Okay. Uh, and so on. <laughs>
chamber here that we are in. What, what are these two figures here, Dr. Ben? Well, the figure on your left is Tutankhamun, and the figure on your right is his wife, the daughter of Akhenaten. She was the fifth daughter uh, of Natim uh, of Tutankhamun. How can you tell this was King Tut? Well, in this case, because I happen to know the question uh, at the, the statue, although there is the, uh, no cartouche for me to follow at this particular point, but at one time there was a cartouche so on he, the body. So even though he was a teenager, he had a wife? Oh, yes. He was married to, um, Akhenaten married him to his daughter before he mounted the throne. Uh, uh, just a quick word about features. Full lips, apparently wide nose. It was. Is wide this nose. an art? It was this an artistic concept, or is this an approximation of how the man looked? Uh, the uh, the artist must have been running through this country, because that that concept is going on a lot of statues. Okay, okay. Now what's this? Uh, the, the, this I see that the holy of holies. Goes up, you so notice it that must it, be the floor start to ramp up, and as soon as the floor start to ramp up, you start to question yourself. I am going to the Holy of Holies. This and is a place that you don't believe in going into. I do not go into the Holies. I pay the reverence as I would not go into a modern synagogue, a modern church, a modern mosque in the Holy of Holies. I show it the respect. You wouldn't walk on the altar of certain churches. No, sir. And this is the no, sir. Uh, I don't have to pray like the people who it belong to, but I show them the respect. What is this? This is based upon a calendar. The, the ancient Egyptians, how they were able to put numbers. Two. One, three. two, three. Three. Ten, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four. Twenty-four. Twenty-four again. Thirty-three. Thirty-two. I see. One hundred, two hundred. 10, 20, 30, 230, 220. Now, how is this used? Well, it was used to add. Like a calculator? Oh, yes. This was used as a calculator. And it was generally based upon months or summon. Uh, they did the addition. They had to, to deal with how much grain, how much tons of this and how tons of that. And that was the mathematical uh, way of doing numbers. Interesting. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to put all of this together? <laughs> In my head? I guess a few years, Bill. A the, few years? Yeah, you don't... A few you, decades. You don't know when you're getting it, when it's coming into you. Well, what do you say to somebody who's looking at this program that we're doing and their head begins to swim? What do you say to them about how they can hope to deal with this? My advice would be don't get perturbed. It's a process of education and it takes time. It took if you time get, to build and it took time to understand. It took more time to build it than it, than I would it say takes so. time to understand it. Now we are going to the temple of Tutmosis the third. Yeah. Aho. The, the, the painter of Jesus. Oh. And Joseph and Mary. The Christians use this temple. This faded figure here is yes. supposed to be of Jesus. Of with Jesus the, with the wrong thing around his head, I think. So this was co-opted by... This was made a Christian temple. Make a, look at the other... T look at the other... Are you going to see more? Here. Here. You see it? There. Yes, I see it. That's the statue of God, the triad of the temple. God Amun, Amun Re, his son Konsu, God Konsu, his wife, Goddess Nut, the holy triad which the Christians copied and called the Trinity. You look at the top of the column, see some are still, still yeah. color, and you see Jesus 
Joseph and Mary, and you see where they copied it from. They cut that up to make it look like a crucifix. The early Christians. Not only did they... How do you know this? Well, because we have the evidence of, of the paintings there. I see. We have the evidence of uh, the cutting of the thing by here it is the um, point itself. These were statues, as you see. They didn't even finish because they didn't finish cutting off the neck and head of the one to the right. And we have the experience of all the other temples that they occupied. Uh -huh. Since Dr. Ben has been coming here for the last 50 years, sometimes as many as six times a year, just about everybody knows it. Dr. Ben brother. Hi, brother. How are you, brother? My brother. How are you? How are you? I've seen you. How are you? Good? Hello. How are you? How are you? Good? Hello. Good? 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 Uh, the or dynasty. Oh, this this lake was built during the 18th dynasty, by under the reign of uh, Amenhotep the third. And what is the purpose of this lake? So that the priests could clean themselves. The priests in every ritual have to take a bath. He, anything that he does in the temple, and any time he enter the temple, he must wash himself before going. Any time he eat. He must wash himself before putting in food in a dirty body. Was there such a thing as a priestess? Yes, but they didn't come here. They had their own uh, temples, and they did not deal with these worship temples. Now, on the left here, I see some steps over on the left side of this uh, lake. Yes, that's so that's the, where they step down so to do the their bathing. Could come down and go, go up. Yes. Let's ride north to see two temples. En route, there was some time to sort out and digest all that this man, Dr. Ben, had shown us. It took almost two hours to reach our first site, the temple at Abydos. But they, they, look, I know she had to fall. I know it will happen. Yes. Hello. 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 Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Go, go on your foot. We don't need that, Al. Forty-two steps. Yeah? Yeah, you could come. Forty-two risers. This was built originally by Pharaoh Seti I. It was extended by his son, Ramesses II. What you are seeing here, this section was built by Ramesses II. And then... There's that name again. <laughs> everywhere. You're going to see him every everywhere. There is uh, Ramesses showing you his father also and himself and the god Osiris. This was just a place of worship for him. It was more than that because when we go outside in the back and up to the rear, it is where Osiris is supposed to have been buried. Oh really? The god of resurrection. It is here that was... The one who was cut up in pieces. Yes. We're the back of the Temple of Set I One. All right. And sitting on the exit and egress, the egress and ingress temple of Osiris. All right. Now, what happened to Osiris? And when you say egress, that means go out. Yes. That means he went out through this tunnel here. Right. What happened that led him to go out through that tunnel? He was murdered for the second time 
and completed his stay in the world, as you know it, and went to the netherworld. Well, let me take you back a, a bit. For those who may be confused when you say he was murdered a second time, what was the first murder? He was hanged by his brother. Yes. His wife, goddess, I said, appeal to God Ra. The God Ra gave them the power to bring him back. She and the God of death, Ampu, otherwise called Anubis. He came back and the brother heard that he was back again. The brother came and killed him for the second time. This time cut him up into 14 pieces. 